Today, we're going to load you up and show you how fear could be costing you millions. Yeah, Brian, I'm excited about this one because I think we live in a world where fear sales, fear sales, where fear <laughs> sells. Uh, and it seems like we're constantly bombarded. There are always things to be frightened about, things to be scared of, but maybe, but maybe... Maybe this time is different. Maybe this time the things that we should be scared of are things that we should actually be scared of, and we should allow that to inform the way that we go about making financial decisions. Yeah, fear can definitely be a, a, a manipulative tool, but here's what I want to teach people the skill set of, because this is something that's that's instinctually inside of us. So, and what I, if you can understand how fear, how greed, and all these things work, you won't panic, and you won't make those desperate decisions from a behavioral standpoint that actually take you three steps backwards, we always want to be walking up the path to building wealth well. And we know this, that like when fear is high, when folks are out there and frightened, when it comes to investing and we think about putting our dollars to work, we have, uh, we oftentimes get nervous and we start to get scared. And when fear is low, we often get excited. We are very much herd creatures with a herd mentality that when things are scary, we all want to run for the exits. And when things look great, we all want to run into the fray. But perhaps that's not the best way to approach it. What, what I like about what we're going to do today is that we've, we've done a lot of case studies, but we typically focus on those obvious periods, you know, the Great Depression, the Great Recession mm -hmm. of the 2008s. We've we decided, you know what, let's instead of going back to these historical catastrophic times, Let's just back up and look at the last year. Mm -hmm. If you were a person that was letting your emotions make your financial decisions, this could be a big mistake, and here's why through a case study. Yeah, and I want you guys to, th to think about this. Have you ever had this thought before of, man, things seem ah, they seem a little scary now. Maybe I just need to, need to sit this one out. Maybe I just need to ride out this turbulent time, and when things get a little bit better, maybe then I'll feel more comfortable. Maybe then I'll go to work. And like you said, Brian, that's the exact case study that we've laid out. So let's assume that we have two investors. We have Nicole and we have Mark. And Nicole is going to let her emotions get the best of her. She is going to make her investment decisions based on fear. So she reinvests when things get good and she gets out of the market when things get bad. Well, so the natural question you might have is, Okay, well, how do we measure fear? How are we going to think about when things are fearful? Well, there are a number of gauges. For purposes of this case study, we're just going to use the Fear and Greed Index. It's been published a couple times over the past year, where you can go see what the general sentiment of the market is on the high side and what the sentiment of the market is on the low side. The metric that we're using, we're just going to assume that when it is the scariest, she decides, I'm going to sit it out, and then when things feel a little bit better, she's going to get back in. But Mark has decided, you know what, I'm going to stay invested the whole time. No matter what goes on, fear high, fear low, I'm going to keep marching forward. And the starting point of this is we actually wanted to start it from the the, the mark where that CNN fear index mm -hmm. hit tippity-top maximum fear out there, and that was September 29th of 2022. So that's the starting point with a million dollars, right? So you, that's right. And you have to kind of put your uh, – remember back, because this wasn't that long ago – in September of 2022, the year was already going bad. Like it was already a year where the market was down around 20%. And the Fed had just come out and done a three quarter of a percent rate hike. And so it, everyone was nervous. Inflation was rampant. Interest rates were rising. Stock market, stock market was falling. And it was frightening. So if you were like Nicole and you followed the same advice and same strategy as she did, you would have pulled your money out on September 29th of 2022. And then you would have put your money back into the market in February of, of 2023. February 1st of 2023 is when the fear index went to a low point. Now, carrying out this strategy from September 29th all the way through present day, you can see that it would have worked out okay for her. She started a million dollars, she sat out, and here, as we sit here in the month of June, she's just over a million dollars, and a million dollars and 20196 but there's more to the there's story because the there's story. Mark who does it the lazy way, the consistent way. He says, you know what? I'm just there's so much money that's been lost by trying to time the markets. I'm just going to drive through it and just 
Just know that my asset allocation, my setup was good before this, so it'll be good after this. Let's let it rip. So look at what happens with Mark. While immediately following that September time frame, his portfolio went down, it then immediately went up, and then it continued to go up, and then it had fits and starts and up and down. But if you look at exactly what his portfolio did by just staying fully invested, he actually ended this period with $1,159,000. That's almost $140,000 more dollars over a seven-month period than what Nicole had. Now, I think a lot of people look at this and go, you guys cherry-picked a very unique period of time. It's less than a year. That's short-term in nature. Yes, it's a 14%, close to 14% spread. But here's what I would remind everyone. Yes, we may, this is kind of an extreme in the fact that it is short-term, and nobody should invest any money mm -hmm. in the financial markets unless you can walk away from that money for at least five to seven years. But here's what I know about investing. The longer your time horizon, the better, because we know eight out of 10 years, historically, close to 80% of the time, markets make money. So you're going to actually, the longer you can stay in the invested, the better your results, the bigger your spread gets to staying consistent, staying in the market to go through the volatility. So I think actually longer term, this gets better, not worse for cherry picking And this. I think what's so, so interesting is you can see that Nicole's strategy actually worked a little bit. I mean, she went to cash and the market went down. So she probably felt great about that. But then the market went up again and then it went down again. So it felt scary another time. And then it went up again and then it went down again. And you can see that Mark's was up and down and up and down and up and down. The problem with this idea of, you know what, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines, is you have to make the decision, okay, when am I going to sit on the sidelines? And when am I going to get back in? How am I going to time that back in? This is a very short-term scenario, but Brian, we've even said, like, maybe if you sat out a whole year, even if you would have missed the year of 2022, by the time that you got back invested in 2023, you've missed a majority of the upside that the market has experienced. So I think that is a futile exercise to try to move in and out of the market over any time period, especially over the short time period. Yeah, for, for sure. The short term, you don't, you never know what you're getting. It's back to that whole Forrest Gump, life's like a box of chocolates, That's you know, <laughs> however, because there's even a slide, because this is, we stratify data by volatility, and you can see 2023 has actually worked out to be mm -hmm. not as volatile. It's pretty calm compared to other years. This is something we found from Charter. If you have, if you don't subscribe to their stuff, go check it out. But yes, there might be more volatility sure. coming our way, but that still doesn't deter me from staying consistent, always be buying, and knowing what the why is for every dollar that I'm putting to work. And I think it's really interesting, as we've had conversations with clients and with folks in our ecosystem, we've asked the question, hey, how has 2023 felt like from an investment standpoint? And the answer we were getting is, oh, yeah, it's ner I'm nervous, and, I, and uh, interest rates, and I'm, it's nerve-wracking. There will always be things that are frightening. There will always be things that are scary. But anecdotally, just looking at this, 2020 had much wilder undulations. Even 2021 and 2022 had larger swings on the upside and downside. Even though this year has not seen those big up days or big bound, down days, it still felt the same. I think that we are in this new normal where the new cycle is always going to make it feel like things are, there are things to be scared of, things to be frightened of, reasons why you should not stay consistent. But if you follow that advice, if you follow that guidance, I don't know that you're setting yourself up for long-term success. I do want to close this out, though, before we start answering questions with just a, a, a piece of guidance, though, that we have had an upswing here in 2023. This is the point where if you look at yourself and you say, man, I was scared to death last September. I mean, to the point that I was making desperate decisions or not thinking clearly, or you know there's a disconnect from when you want to retire, how you're structured asset-wise from an allocation, this is the time probably mm -hmm. to, to measure twice. Yep. Go this, mm -hmm. Use this point, this recovery, to say, how do I have an allocation that matches my goals, matches my behaviors? This is the time to recalibrate and actually have a plan. Because as I was talking about earlier, a plan that was good before volatility is going to be good through the volatility and good after the volatility, but you got to have the plan first. So use this moment to choose action to get your financial life in order. And so one of the best things that you can do, one of the best tools that you can use when things are 
scary and uncertain is to educate yourself, is to figure out how can I understand what's going on. And we love that we get to be part of that education resource for you. So we want to make sure that we're speaking to the things that you care about, that we are weighing in on the topics you'd like for us to weigh in on. So right now, we have the team out in the wings collecting your questions because we want to make sure that we load you up with the information that can help you take your finances to the next level. So with that, producer Reeby, I'm going to throw it over to you. We're ready to go. All right, I've got some questions here, and we are going to kick it off with Dylan's question. I have my first down payment in ETFs in a taxable brokerage. I plan to buy in the next three years. How quickly should I sell it off and move it to cash? Lump sum all at once or on a regularly regular monthly basis? Ooh, now this, this is a really interesting question, mm -hmm. Brian. It's one I feel like um, we get a lot. And the answer that I, the pithy answer I would say is, if you'll just tell me exactly what the market's going to do in the next three years, I can give you the optimal strategy. No doubt about it. Because obviously, if the market goes up, you'd want to leave that money invested for as long as possible so you can maximize the value of those dollars. However, if the market goes down and it cuts the other way and you start to see it go down, well, then what happens when you get to the place to where you don't have enough of the down payment or you don't have enough of a down payment that you thought you were, your monthly payment is going to be much larger. So for someone who's in Dylan's situation, Brian, three years out, a uh, fully invested portfolio, what's the best way for him to think about over 36 months to begin uh, uh, freeing up that capital? Dylan, I'm going to go ahead and just lay it out there for you. If you know for sure you're pulling the trigger and, and actually making this purchase within three years, I, I think it's, we don't know if the market's going to lose 15% next month, you know, or maybe it's going to make 15% over the next three months. That Nobody has any clue whatsoever. But what I do know is that we have just come through somewhat of a recovery mm -hmm. and you're going to make a decision now in a short-term manner and you have your assets in something that's designed for a long-term outlook, meaning five to seven years at least, you've kind of broken that threshold. So for me, it's grip and rip, turn it to cash, make sure, and that, that's step one. Step two is now cash, you, let's go ahead and put it in something that's actually going to earn you some money because you can make close to 5% on mm -hmm. your cash reserves now. So you know, turn it into to liquid, to, to liquidate it, and then immediately try to find a money market. And, you know, a lot of your brokerage accounts now at Vanguard, at Fidelity Investments, um, I believe even Charles Schwab, mm -hmm. those type of places, the largest brokerage companies are now offering money markets that are paying close to 5%. They're very stable within invested in treasuries and things like that. Go ahead and get that money in there. So then you actually will have the money for this home purchase because you're going to feel sick if you don't make that decision and then the the portfolio gets beat up these etfs go down 15 percent, and then you just go kick yourself for years to come on, on on being so cute with the timing of this hmm. you disagree i wouldn't say i disagree I disagree I, I, is too strong you know. i will tell you what i like about your strategy is that right now cash is paying four and a half five percent so it is a great resting place i think uh, this is where, Dylan, I want to know a little bit more about your personal situation. Like, where's your emergency reserve at? How much cash do you have on hand? Because I thought for sure, Brian, you were going to say reverse dollar cost averaging. I thought you were going to say, hey, you know what? Let's do some sort of strategy. Well, right now, we know that the market has improved from where it was last year. Now, we've not made back what we lost last year. So technically, we are still below where the market was in January of 2022. But maybe I do some sort of mathematics, and these mathematics are way more art than science, but if I know I need, you know, $60,000 for a down payment, I'm making up a number here, maybe I go ahead and free up half of that in cash right now to start earning 5%, and then I figure out over 36 months, I figure out how to reverse dollar cost average in case there is a chance that the market is likely going to continue to increase. Do you think that's just way too aggressive? No way, no how, you wouldn't well, do I'll it? I'll play devil's advocate with you because I think if you were... If you took your situation, you made an A-B analysis on it, mm -hmm. and you said, okay, I'm going to do this over time, and the, what's a good case scenario that if you if you do reverse dollar cost average is that you make 12% on your money a year from now? Well, the delta between what you can make on the cash is 5%. That's a 7% spread. Mm -hmm. However, how this could go bad, just take it that you lose 12% on the other side. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, there's, it's not like there's anything that reduces that. You have to ask yourself, it's a really a risk tolerance, but mm-hmm. also a risk capacity. I think you get both elements of the risk dis- d- discussion because your spread on the upside is you might make 7% more, but there's potential you could lose 12% or greater. Um, how does that make you feel? Uh, on a b analysis look at that because that's really kind of your spread and uh, you know and then the other part is risk capacity wise i don't think you have time to recover so if you miss this up and that is your razor edge on your down payment and this now takes you outside of the threshold to be able to buy the the, what you think is in the price point is it worth the risk Hmm. and that that's why i would i would handicap this to figure out a b decision which one is best for me i'm not gonna fight you on that that's how you win a point, guys. All oh, right. Okay. He wants to. Uh, okay. Agree, disagree, want to fight. Okay. I mean, I do have a counterpoint. But I know that's a good answer. I like that. I'm on board. All right. If you say so, Dylan, there's your answer. Thanks for your question. We, rep- we appreciate you being here. Let's move on to Raymond's question. It says Can you expand on ratios for saving, investing, home, 238? all those things, all the rules and things that we talk about that give a percentage of your gross income. After taxes, it doesn't seem to be enough to spread around and cover living expenses. My car is 4%, my home is 20%. With four kids, it's getting hard to get all of that in. Any advice on how he should be thinking about this? Yeah, Raymond, it's hard, right? You got four kids. I'm gonna assume that means that you have four young kids who are still in the house. You are what we would affectionately call in the messy middle. You are in that stage of life where your disposable time is down, your disposable income is down, and your obligations are way, way up. You have a thousand different things pulling you in a thousand different directions. And when it comes to how you allocate your capital, you have your capital having to be allocated in a thousand different directions. I mean, I love car payment 4%, assuming that's on a three-year payoff, you're following the money guy rule. Housing at 20% uh, of your total of your uh, total gross income, that is also following a money guy rule. So you're in the great spot. Saving 25%, I don't know if he said that was what he's saving, but if you're saving 25% or you're moving towards that, you're doing the things you're supposed to do, but it ain't easy. It's it's difficult. And I think the number one thing that you have to do is you have to just take a breath and say, it's going to be okay. Not at all points in time in my financial journey will I be able to do every single thing the absolute best way that I can. And sometimes there are trade-offs. Sometimes life gets tight and we have to be tight for a season, but then that loosens up and we're able to double down on some of those other goals. I think it's okay, especially in the messy middle, for folks to give themselves a little bit of grace so long as they're not getting out ahead of their skis, they're not getting the more expensive cars or they're doing the fancy travel or they're buying the expensive house. If it really is just things are tight because life is tight because of my family circumstance, I think it's okay to have a little grace during that period and then work to improve on it through time. Well, I want to make sure we clarify on any of the the, the, the mitigators or grace providers for, for some of our ratios. First of all, Raymond, have you gone to make sure, assuming on the savings and investing, we always talk about the 20, 25%. Don't forget, if you're a household making less than $200,000, you get to count that employer um, contribution. So if you have an employer that's doing a match, as well as profit sharing contributions and other things, employee stock purchase plans, whatever it be, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you find out that your employer might be putting five to six, maybe even up to 8% mm-hmm. of your compensation into retirement for you back that out if you feel like you're sque- it's squeezing all of the oxygen out of your life make sure you're you're taking into account all the funding sources that go into the to to the, your different margins now that's something that hopefully makes the process feel less pressurized but i do want to kind of tie into what bo was saying you know i think it surprises a lot of people i did not feel comfortable financially I had created so much forced scarcity in my life by prioritizing saving and investing while I was in my 20s and 30s. It wasn't until I was probably 42 to 43 years old that I actually felt like I could breathe deep and I came out the other side and felt like I was actually a successful person. Mm -hmm. Um, But that doesn't mean that I was, you know, living a miserly lifestyle. I just bedazzled my basic life. We still went on vacations. We did things, but it's just that I had to run a budget. I had to keep the expenses and I kept very much a a disciplined life 
to prioritize what's the life that I want to live mm-hmm. in the future. And, and I know that's tough. That's why we call it the messy middle. We're very deliberate on being transparent that it's not going to feel easy, but we try to give you realistic, actionable rules that will help you come out the other side. And then when you get in your 40s and you're living in abundance, you'll be like, holy cow, th- this was worth it. Because also, I think there's some some side benefits to squeezing things down in your 20s and 30s too, is that first of all, it's making you better with your resources so that you're not wasteful because it, it, lifestyle creep is legitimate, meaning as you're getting pay raises, if you're not prioritized, making sure you're, you're, you're saving and investing and giving, then how are you going to do it as you then add kids, you add the houses, mm-hmm. all that stuff is an exercise in, in making sure you're honing your skills of discipline. And, and I know it's tough, but I also think that in the long term, it will help even with the kids because if you build this abundance, you will get. They will be at the age where, and it, it, that maybe they didn't get every toy that they wanted. Maybe they didn't get spoiled, but you'll get. You'll hopefully be teaching them by, by growing up in this healthy financial life um, and modeling healthy financial behaviors in front of them. You're also not only get to live your best life in your 40s, 50s, and beyond, all the way through retirement. Which, if you think about it, it's only a 20 year sacrifice for a 60 year benefit Mm -hmm. and you probably pay it forward by having kids that understand a much better relationship because they saw it modeled with their parents uh, on how they should handle money. And and I know that sounds crazy, but I I really do believe it. And I think that all that stuff works hand in hand together, but do make sure you take a time. I pick on Bo about this because all of us achievers, we get so in a hurry to, to check off the goals, do bedazzle your basic life. Still make sure you're taking the time to go build memories um, I mean, still some of my favorite memories were that was the summer my dad was laid off mm-hmm. and we went into timeshare presentations. I mean, I know that sounds hokey. We didn't get to, but it was just being time with the family was just so valuable that I, I just want you to make sure it doesn't have to be expensive, but you, we got lots of parks. We got all kind of really cool things, mm-hmm. beaches. I mean, there's things that you can do um, without breaking the budget, but still create those valuable memories that we all get to take for us into forever. And it's okay that it feels hard. I mean, I think if you ask anyone who's in this stage of life, even even folks with great incomes and great savings rates, and even if even if that's not the issue, this is a hard stage of life. And I think it's okay to acknowledge that and to kind of sit in that, and be like, you know what, this is great. This is this is forming me, and I'm going to make it through on the other side, and I'm going to get to a ripe, ripe, ripe old age like Brian and think, you know what? It worked. It worked really well. It went well. Uh, so what's the Jerry Rice quote is, I'm going to do the hard stuff today so I can do the the stuff nobody else can do in the future or something like that. It's kind of, you know, yeah, it was it, something like that. it's very similar. Dave Ramsey also has that, that saying, I'm going to live like no one else so I can live like no one else. Yep. But I, I like Jerry's. It's a really great quote that I always think about whenever I'm challenged to do something really difficult. Always think about that Jerry Rice quote. Today I will do what others want, so tomorrow I can do what others can't. That's exactly right. That's awesome. There you go. Love it. Raymond, thank you for that question. Hopefully that helps you out today. Got kind of a trendy question from Braden. He says, where does the Money Guy show see AI taking the financial industry? What aspects of the financial industry will always require human interaction versus could be put off or assisted with with AI. Mm. What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's really interesting. So we live in, uh, you know, we're financial advisors on our in our day job, and so we live in this world where it seems like every uh, industry publication that comes out is talking about how will technology, how will AI, is it going to replace the field? Is it going to do away with the need for financial advisors? Is it going to fill in the blank? And we, you know, we saw the same, a, a similar type thing when robo advisors came out, and that was a thing. And it's really interesting. If you, if you listen to the show for long enough, you've heard Brian and I talk about how when it comes to financial planning and when it comes to designing a plan and when it comes to making financial decisions, there are equal parts, science and mathematics, like do this, don't do this, binary ones and zeros. But then there's also the art part. Uh, and I think what's really, really interesting about finance is when you can learn how to marry the mathematics and the art together, that's when you get something that's really, really really, really neat, right? So like our financial order of operations is one of the beautiful things I love. Brian, will you hold up the thing for me real quick uh, while you're taking this? If you've not seen our financial order of operations, right? It's nine steps tried and true that you can follow to figure out what to do with your dollars. Well, you can approach it very rigidly and say, okay, I got to 
go one, two, three, four, five, six. And that is indeed the way that you should approach it and that'll help you. But at some point in your financial journey, the art has to come into it. And if you're someone who's thinking about fire and you're thinking about leaving the workforce early, or maybe your employer has a different sort of account structure, there are ways that you have to sort of customize and move from sort of generalized solutions to very specialized and specific solutions. And so I think so long as we live in a world where that's the case, then there's always going to be a place for advisors, for folks like us in the financial world to help kind of guide and cultivate that. But what I think is crazy is the folks out there that want to fight against technology. I mean, I'll tell you personally, what we're trying to do is figure out, okay, all these advances in technology and artificial intelligence and all these sort of, how can we better utilize that to better use the message to better help the folks out there? We don't think it's going to be a negative, bad, disruptive thing. I mean, it may be disruptive. We think it's actually be a huge asset, something incredibly valuable that perhaps will allow us to do more for our folks, provide better service, provide better counsel, uh, to more people on a grander scale, I think it's more exciting than than uh, than frightening. Yeah, I, I get excited about it. I'm not scared about it at all. And let me explain why. First of all, AI, if you've been playing around with it, it is so good at taking and processing large batches of data. That gets me excited because it means a lot of stuff with you know, processing, tax return prep, and tax review, and those things. A lot of that stuff because, uh, you know, did you – answer the problem correctly or solve the problem correctly, AI is going to crush that. Mm -hmm. It's going to do so well. Um, it does very good on binary decisions. Is it zero? Is it one? Is it zero? Is it one? That's perfect. But the problem, here's where I, I feel very confident that we're not going to be replaced. And I felt confident, like as Bo has already talked about, when the robo-advisors showed up, when all these automated solutions supposedly started you know, coming into the marketplace, mm -hmm. None of them have been able to really replace the financial advisor, the personal advisor. And you have to start asking why. And, here, and here's why. First of all, to do financial planning right, you're getting into people's lives that have so many variables. Mm -hmm. Because as I've told you guys, every client that shows up here as a prospect, um, I can talk about tax allocation. I can talk about tax location. Mm -hmm. And, and people show up like fingerprints. They all are different because we all walk in these different lives and, and on how we build our financial assets. So nobody looks the same. So that's one facet. And then you add on that us inefficient, emotional beings of humans. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we're, not, we're not exactly the most efficient decision makers. That's why you have this whole behavioral science where you walk about how we, we make decisions that are not in our best interest because we react the whole fear and greed mm -hmm. cause lots of issues for us. So a lot of times a financial advisor not only has to be a very analytical decision maker to try to make the right decisions on the fork in the road moments, those incremental decisions, but you also have to be very efficient at navigating the personal struggles that a person has, but then also the relationship struggles that couples will have because it's not uncommon that they try to use you as the um, mediator mm -hmm. on things that they don't agree with. So I don't, I don't see how artificial intelligence can necessarily navigate the complexities of being the human mm -hmm. who not has to have, um, you know, the ounce of uh, of analytical skill set, the ounce of experience to know what does it feel like to actually go from zero to build wealth, or what does it feel like for small business owners? Those are all different components that you you add that wisdom in, and then you add that relationship person or, or counselor type component mm -hmm. of it, where you're helping people navigate something that's very inefficient, not something that somebody is going to be willing to type in the variables. I, I remember, you know, when, when we did our re, our AI reaction show, we asked a prenup question. And oh, my goodness. I mean, if you actually <laughs> use the answer that they I was like, has this, obviously this this poor, sweet computer here. Um, we don't want to offend them in case they are taking over the world. But it, it is one of those things where. You bless their heart. They just didn't. They don't understand how human relationships work because if you came in and said that, you, you, I mean, the, the couple would be like, "What? What are we doing? We're taking our advice from this mm -hmm. soulless thing that just talked about prenups that way." So I, I just don't worry about that. I think it'll be great at processing data. I think the smart financial advisor that's trying to figure out how you can leverage that, we are. 
um, you're, you're going to be able to just become even better because we're going to be able to go through much higher data sets. We're going to be able to think about when you're processing risk, when you're thinking about all the stress testing and everything you do for a financial mm-hmm. advisor, that stuff's going to get easier. Mm-hmm. Reviewing a tax return is going Way to be easier. easier, but still allows us to get better at those soft skill things that um, that, that I think is just priceless um, for somebody. Because remember, you only get one retirement. We process tons of retirements so you can hopefully know how to navigate your best version of yourself so you own your time and focus your life on doing what you really want to do. Awesome. Braden, thanks for the question. Next up, we have a question from Caleb. He says, how do you overcome the fear of making sure you are providing enough for your children's future while saving for your own? For context, I am an expectant father, so congrats, first of all. That's exciting. So is it a legit fear to ensure that I am setting her up for the future while also providing for my wife's and I? It's such a hard balance to strike. So... Yeah, Potential new dad, he's like, oh, man, what's go- what am I going to do now? <laughs> First off, congratulations, because uh, it's awesome. Having kids rocks. It's a super fun thing, so it's a fun fun journey you're about to be on. Um, this is, It's hard, right? Because we, we, there, there's a natural struggle that when you hold that baby for the first time, I think it was Ryan Realty, he's like, I would jump in front of a bullet for this kid, right? Like, and I just met them, like, today, and they're amazing. Uh, and so we want to do everything as parents in our power to provide for them and to create a life that is better for them than our life was for us and all of these things. But what that naturally causes us to do is it naturally causes us to act in a very irrational manner. We start trying to take care of them and provide for them before we've made sure that we've put ourselves on solid foundational footing. And so what I would tell like a new expected parent is focus on the non- money stuff when it comes to your kids. Focus on loving them well, teaching them well, raising them the way that you want them to be raised, teaching them the things that you want to know. And if they get to adulthood, if they get to age 18, 19, 20, and they've got those things, but they don't have a trust set up for them, or they don't have a big bu- bucket of money, they are going to be well equipped to go out in the world and go create the big bucket of money. But if you've not taught them the skills that matter, the skills that are necessary to be able to translate that later in life, this is going to be a much harder road for them, even if you leave them a bunch of money. So I would argue, I would not get so caught up on the financial stuff. Focus on the soft stuff, especially when your kids are young. Make sure that you and your spouse are on financial footing, because we say this all the time, the single best gift, uh, one of the single best gifts you can give to your kids is not having to move in with them when you retire, unless you want to. If you want to, that's totally cool, but not because you have to. Yeah, I was, uh, I'll kind of echo that and the fact that the easiest path here, go get the financial order of operations, moneyguy.com slash resources. Go get your, your food for you. Um, if you want to accelerate that, you've listened to us talk about it, you'd be like, I don't want to go watch every video these guys have done. How do I accelerate? Go to learn.moneyguy.com. We actually have a, a deep dive course on the financial order of operations. But that's going to help you to kind of f- do exactly what Bo was talking about, prioritizing, getting your why figured out so you get your financial household in order. You also model good behavior for your child um, so that you're do- setting up not only yourself for success, but you're, you're setting your child up by, by modeling those real-world successful behaviors down the road. And then guess what? If you do this the right way, there will be that opportunity um, when you get around step eight of the financial order of operations, start saving for you know college and other types of goals like that. Because so, I think your obligation as a parent is really to make sure that you're creating good humans that turn mm-hmm. into productive and good adults down the road. So it's not necessarily setting up, can, can my kids be loaded? Because I know we talk about, we even have the young savers. You can go to moneyguy.com um, slash resources, and we do have the money multiplier for young savers. And it is pretty exciting to see that for you know a brand new newborn, hmm. I only need to, to invest just a little bit of money because their dollar is worth $647 amazing. if I invest that right. We only have to save $13 a month to get them to be millionaires. That's super, super exciting. But the thing that creates true success is making sure that they're equipped Mm -hmm. um, to to, to live life productively and um, to to, to have the life skills to do well. So I would focus on getting your life in order, 
doing the financial order of operations, when you get to step eight, you can do the college savings. And then as they get their first jobs, don't, don't, don't worry. I think it's very valuable to prime the pump, you know, get them to ma- dollar for dollar match as they start wanting to invest or fund those custodial Roth IRAs. You, you help them make that happen by priming the pump. Once again, these are life skills that will serve them well. When they buy the first car, Tell them that you're only going to pay for half of it, you know, and it's got to be a matching dollars because you got to, if you can get somebody to have buy-in, that's your biggest thing is you are modeling good behavior, teaching good life skills. It's not to create mega millionaires before um, they have even the skill set to handle that. I think that's something that, because your, your job and responsibility is not to leave a, a legacy of millions of dollars for them. It's really to create the, the make sure your, your your kids are equipped with the life skills to be productive. And this is why, I mean, we had a, a studio tour yesterday. Matthew came through, mm-hmm. and, and super successful. Um, works in the IT field, and he was like, "Man, I, I had to pay for college. Um, I had to do this. And I felt like I've learned so much about life that I, I don't know. Just because I'm being my wife and I are successful now, that I want to take all of that from, that from my, my kid, kids yeah. because there is something about." having that scarcity or that struggle. So just make sure that you're building enough into the plan because if you give your kids only easy street, you might be setting them up to be more economic dependent mm-hmm. on you and and not having the life skills. And that's why you see when, when, when you go back to the old, the you know, millionaire next door, when Dr. Stanley and Danko were doing their research, they found that millionaire families typically their ki- adult children were pretty self-sufficient mm-hmm. because if you've got a bunch of adult children that never failure to launch, that's a long-term legacy issue that means that maybe we skip some steps. Yep. Well, Caleb said outstanding guidance. Thank you guys. So Congratulations. Glad, glad that you got to hear so that. Awesome. Yeah. We're super excited for you, Caleb. Okay. Let's move on to Jesse S's question. It says, I keep hearing thrown around that millionaires have on average seven streams of income. Money Guy Show, does this track with your experience and with your clients? And if so, what do they look like? And I mean, you guys have a lot of interesting connections. You've worked with a lot of interesting clients. You're interesting people yourselves. What would you say to this? Yeah, it's really interesting. First, I think what you have to define is how do you, what do you consider streams of income, right? So some people, like obviously like wages, W-2 income, they're just coming in, a stream of income. Some people consider stream of income like portfolio growth, right? Like if my portfolio is growing and I got dividends paying in, that's a stream of income that's also taking place and compounding. So I think you have to define that. Um, I don't think, and Brian, I'll be curious for you to weigh in on this. I don't think it's uncommon for millionaires to have multiple streams of income, but I would also say in our experience, it has not been a necessity. You know, we have an annual wealth survey that goes out that we ask, hey, how would you define your path to millionaire? Were you an entrepreneur? Were you a virtuoso, have some unique skill and talent? Are you an executive? Or are you just a saver and investor? You know, you have a job and you save consistently. And it's amazing that the vast majority, I mean, the vast majority of folks identify as savers and investors, not not necessarily people that went out and found a bunch of different income streams and how to create these huge incomes, but they more figured out how to master deferred gratification, taking whatever their income is, whether it's through multiple streams or a single stream, and consistently save through time. So I think that, Uh, Having additional streams of income can be helpful and can be valuable, but I would not say that having seven streams of income is a necessity to get to millionaire status. Well, I I think it's good clickbait titles, but I I just sat here and I was like, well, let's let's, let's do this. So I was like, look, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I think the majority of millionaires, I I can count five very easily Mm -hmm. and and, and follow me through this. First, you got your J-O-B, your job, you know, what you do to to get the W-2 or that that's one. I've got portfolio. Well, I guess it's saying passive or no, just streams. Okay, so job counts, portfolio, but portfolio is not one because I, originally I was like, man, this is only going to be four, but no, it's going to be interest, dividends, appreciation through capital gains. So those are all. See, I'm telling you, but this is how they had to have gotten to seven. Okay. So I know I can see your this is real some estate math. Real Keep estate. Going. Well, when you say seven, what do you think they're doing? Real <laughs> estate. Is because we, you know, if you, if it, typically somebody you inherit a house or you got into yeah. owning a, you a house, you never sold your first house. You never sold. There's somehow you end up 
stumbling and tripping and fall and you trip and fall into owning some real estate. So there's, there's your fifth. Now I thought, I mean, now we've, cause we do the podcast and you know, the Ours YouTube. Is unique, though. So, but I did think about that because I, I think a lot of people feel a lot of pressure when they see a stat like that, where, you know, that you got to have seven streams, but this is no different than, cause there's another book out there by a financial person that shows that they'll, they'll post a stat like Reese, our research shows that millionaires pay off their house in 10 years. Mm-hmm. And I'm always like, man, that's an incredible stat. That makes me feel like I have a lot of pressure on my shoulders. But then you go and you say, what's the asterisk? What's the footnotes on that stat? And what you find out later is, is that, yes, millionaires do pay it off, but this is not their first home. It might even be their second home because realize the average millionaire is like 49 years old when they cross that threshold. So you're talking about people in their 50s who probably are in this mindset now. Let's pay off all the debt. So you can still have the stat without really getting the clarification of what nuances went into it. And I think this is the same thing, is that, yes, probably millionaires do have at least five streams of income coming in, but that's not necessarily, you're going to end up there. Don't don't aspire to create streams so you can resemble a millionaire. I want you to aspire to get to the critical mass or the escape velocity point of how do you get to a million dollars? Because once you get your assets through saving, through investing, through automatic for the people, making the the easy habit, uh, the good habit easy, that is actually what's going to make it. And then all of a sudden you're going to find out once you cross that threshold, all of a sudden all, all these other streams start showing up because you're going to have a, a portfolio large enough that now when a real estate opportunity comes your way, you jump on yep. it, you know, or, or some other way, a side hustle comes on you, man, that's a great deal. I think that's what I want to retire to. I want to get into content creation. There's another hustle that jumps in. I would not aspire just to create seven streams of income. I would actually try to figure out what's my entry point into seven figure status and how do I hit it hard, hit it often and make it happen. You know what I think millionaires have more than streams of income they have multiple savings streams. Because I was thinking through this, when we, when we think about the millionaires that we work with, if you look at the financial order of operation, they got a stream that's going into their 401k and they got a stream that's going into their Roth IRAs, they got a stream that's going into their HSAs, they got a stream that's going into their after tax. Their saving streams, where their money is going to invest, way more important than where the money's coming into them from. So what you do with the dollars that come to you, I think, is where the attention should be focused, not on the income that you're generating. Yeah, and and if I was being honest, because I was stretching to try to get to seven, here, here's like my own personal self-assessment. And multimillionaires, job, portfolio, mm-hmm. real estate, money guy show. Yep. So, I mean, that was four. I don't see a seven. That's why I had to get creative. And, and even start. those, you didn't have all of those at once. I think yeah. sometimes no, you that's see what the I'm millionaires saying. who do have that. Cross that's because like, they built two. They that's didn't right. that's, The start. stats never tell you yeah. where. This is, they, they're looking at the results after the fact. You need to figure out how do you get to the entry point. And that's why I think these are distractions. Just like if you heard that stat on millionaires pay off their debt and their mortgage in 10 years. If you prioritize that while you're in your 20s and 30s, you're missing the boat. You've right. lost the point. Of, yeah, it's still true, but you, that doesn't mean that that's what you ought to be prioritizing. That's why financial order of operations, go get it. Because mm-hmm. moneyguy.com slash resources, we're not playing around. This actually helps you to know what to do with your next dollar to prioritize the journey without all the distractions that crazy stats like that can tell you. Awesome. All right. Well, great question, Jesse. Thanks for submitting. We're going to move on to Ruby's question. She says, "Is this is hypothetical, hmm. but say I have the money for 20% down on a first home, but I could get a VA loan with 0% down. Should I put the money down on the house or should I put it aside for unexpected costs or invest it or something else? Are there any like unintended consequences here? Yeah, the, the, this question was a little bit easier a couple of years ago, right? When we had mortgage interest rates at like two and a half, two and three quarters, 3%, it was a little bit easier to kind of walk through some mathematics here. Interest rates aren't as kind as they were a couple of years ago. You know, now we're seeing mortgage rates, five and a half, six and a half, seven percent 7%. And so there's like a very significant opportunity cost when you think about down payment. You know, if I put 20% down, that means that my payment will be lower, I'll be financing less, my interest cost will be less. 
if I put less down, then my interest cost is gonna go up and it's gonna go up by whatever my interest rate is. So I have to like think through that arbitrage. Now Ruby, I was tracking with her question really, really well, Brian, until right there at the end where she said, uh, or should I put some aside so I have some for emergencies and contingent? Mm -hmm. That is one of the number one problems that I see first time home buyers make is they get so caught up in getting to the down payment and saving all that money, saving all that money, that they literally take all of their liquidity, all of their capital, and they try to get this down payment so they can get on the home ownership side of things. And then they get the keys and they walk in their house for the first time and they're like, uh-oh, I've got no cash. I can't, I can't put blinds on it. I can't go buy the lawnmower. Uh-oh, what do I do? I am always a staunch advocate that if you're gonna buy a house, you need to have a contingency reserve fund for all the things that come along with home ownership. This may be part of your emergency fund if you have a fully built emergency fund, or it may even be a separate fund for first time home buyers for all the things that you didn't know that you didn't know that come along with home ownership. I, I, um, this is one, I, I, first of all, I'm gonna sound like a politician. I hate hypothetical questions <laughs> because everybody has different variables. I'm sitting here listening to Ruby tell ask this question. And I'm like, man, it so depends upon where she is in her financial order of operations. But Bo did say she Ruby did give us enough to where you're like, oh, okay, she's not there um, because there are you know if you had flown through the financial order of operations and moneyguy.com/resources. If you if you know if you had like your emergency reserves all loaded up, that's what this windfall. Obviously, if you have twenty percent, that means you have a big chunk of money that mm -hmm. came your way. And we've even had friends of the show who like a family member or they came, they sold something or they came into some money, and and we've had this exact situation present itself to us. And and what I saw, and, and I've even shared this because I got a lot of hate for it. I, I'll tell you two scenarios. We had a we had a, a, a friend of the show who's a younger person that came into a windfall of money, and then I had back when I used to teach a Sunday school class, I had a, a widow who came up to me right at the end when she found out what I did for a living after she known me for a little bit, and she goes, "I inherited this life insurance policy when my husband unexpectedly died, and she still had kids in the house." And she goes, "And the first everybody told me go pay off your house." Mm. And, you know, so it's a little different than what Ruby's presented, but it's still a very similar scenario. And I, and I still remember she's like, I made the worst decision is I went and paid off the house. Now I can barely put groceries on the mm -hmm. table because I didn't have, I don't have a cash reserves. I, I don't have, you know, if the, no the gutters need to be replaced, I, I, the roof needs anything. I, I just, I, I, I cut it too close and now I'm having trouble just covering my living expenses. So this is the same thing. Ruby's, it's just different. This is a younger person trying to buy their first home. And if they're thinking if I have 20%, because we had that other person that's come to us that they they, they had a, a family gift or something that came. They put this down payment on the house. But then now they now they, they can barely afford to, to do anything. Mm -hmm. They're not funding their Roth. They're not doing, because they just used that money. They thought that was a healthy decision. I think the actual real answer is a balance through the financial order of operations is because you need to make sure after you buy this house, whether it's a 3% all the way up to a 20% down payment, that you still have enough money for cash reserves. Mm -hmm. Because what happens if you lose your job in month three after you, you bought this house? That's you need scary. to have the money to cover that. So it might be three months. It might be six months. You need to have emergency reserves taken. And then fast forward, what if this person has zero investments to their name and they have 20% and they could get this mortgage, at, you know, say this is a 33-year-old person, doesn't have any investments in their name, but came into this windfall, you know, maybe they need to put down 5%, but then, you know, have cash reserves, but then they can... Um, they still need to fund a Roth IRA because you got to get some money working for the, the future so you can have a Roth IRA or something like that. Um, so there's a balance here. That's why I hate answering a question with a question, but there's just too many variables, and that's why hypotheticals can get you in trouble, and that's why I can give you good general advice, but when you get to the point of something like this, you might want to you know, really go through a system like the Financial Order of Operations to help you allocate each of those next dollars because that will at least allow you to kind of go through here and figure out have I done the Roth as a, where am I at on paying this down based upon where I am from an age standpoint as well and my goals. Excellent. All right, Ruby, thanks for that question. We appreciate it. Moving on to Matthew's question. 
if you were able at birth, at the birth of your child to invest the $1,550 to make your child a millionaire by age 65, what type of account would you do and how would you invest this? Would you invest the lump sum? Would you do it in a brokerage? Would you put it in a 529, something totally different? And can I be honest, we get this question all the time. Every time we post about this young wealth multiplier, which you can get for free at moneyguy.com slash resources, people are always like, but where do I put it? Where do I put it for my zero year old child? Yeah. So help them out. I love it. Um, so the first question was, okay, do I do a lump sum or do I do some other thing? Well, the way that we designed this, the mathematics behind the wealth multiplier was we wanted to tell you what lump sum should you invest or could you invest today to be worth a million dollars by the time they get to 65. So that in and of itself, the way to the exercise, we would say on, you know, uh, in the hospital, you know, as soon as you leave the delivery room, uh, before you get home with the baby, you're going to run by your favorite financial institution. You're going to drop down $1,550. You're going to deposit it right there, lump sum to invest. Now, in terms of number of accounts or type of, account, type of account, there are a number of different types of accounts you can do. I'm going to start with the first that I don't think, if this is the purpose, that I probably would not do. The math that we use to turn $1,550 into a million requires a timeline to get your baby from zero to 65, right? So the goal is this is for like future retirement, future dollars. I would not use a 529 account for that specific purpose because the odds are you're going to use a 529 either for college education or private K through 12. That's going to be probably between ages zero and 22, much shorter timeline, 1550, likely won't turn into a million by the time you get there. So if I'm thinking through, my goal is to have them be retirement millionaires, I probably don't want to do a 529 account for those dollars. So if I'm not going to do the 529 and that's not where I'm going to park it, where should I potentially think about parking this oh, money? Oh, man, I mean, this question kind of cracks me up a little bit because I think about the fact of a brand new parent, because... Yes, it is super exciting to know all I have to do is a little less than two grand and my kid will likely be a millionaire by the time they're 65. But that ain't with the way. That's not the way life works. Because here's what's going to happen. Your kid's going to get to be 18 years old and they got to go to college. And you're going to go, man, where, where do we, how do we pay for college? And you're going to look at that account that you set up. And then if you didn't set it up in a 529 um, because you didn't have any other assets, if this is the only asset you had, you're going to be ticked because this account's now going to be worth, I don't know, I'm just going to throw out a number. Let's just say your your $1,500 is now worth $35,000, $40,000. Mm -hmm. You know, I haven't done the math on it. But it's, um, you're like, gosh, i got to pay taxes on $42,000 to pay for the kid's college. Right. That's going to gut like, a you know, 25% of the value, depending upon which state you live in and so forth. Like, I should have done the 529. Then it would have been completely tax-free. So if you only have this one pot of money, it, you have to promise yourself that it's not going to, because you're going to feel horrible if you tell your kid, and this is the only way they can go to college is to get access to this money. And be like, no, no, that's your millionaire money. You know, you, I don't want you to get educated. I want you just to be a millionaire no, at 65. No, tell them, hey, there's not many retirement loans. You can take out a student loan. There's the answer to that one. No, but then, then that's yeah, not going to work well. That's college. a disaster. So I think the the, the, the way I, the, my question here is why matters so much when you have children, if you have money to set aside, you have to immediately say, what is the purpose of this dollar? That is the, what the entire origin story of the financial order of operations. And I want every dollar, you're the general here. I want every dollar to have a purpose. So you have to ask the why it matters. So if this money is to be a sixty for to be used at sixty five, you have to promise yourself you're not going to use it for education, which that's going to be the first thing that somebody's going to ask. And your kid's not going because realize also what I tell you on the decision. If it's like a custodial account, there's this the weird thing that happens to custodial accounts when your kids turn adults. What's a custodial account? You know, it's a, an account you, the parent, or any adult can set up where it ultimately when they reach age of majority in your state. That account now goes from a custodial to it's now a full their account and they can turn it into and go buy a Ferrari and go do whatever they want, you know, at any point in time because it's theirs. And that's, that was my point is, is that as soon as you set up that custodial account, you have to understand when they reach age of majority, they might disagree. So th think about that. You set up this millionaire purpose money. You better be educating them on the value of a dollar because otherwise when they get to be 20 
eight years old and they meet that special person. I know for me, I, I'd, I'd have gone and bought the engagement ring with that pot of money. Yeah, for I sure. I wouldn't have been you know, like, what do I care about? It's a million dollars and 65. I'm trying to marry this person. So I'm going to be like, I'm going to pull out that pot first. I mean, so there's a lot of things that could, life is going to get in the way. So I, I would say if your ultimate goal is to turn it into a million dollars, I'm going to tell you the unrealistic thing without life that I see all over social media. You go hire this kid as a model, file a, a schedule C. It's so, so, it's so ridiculous. It's dumb. And then, and then I'll put it in a custodial Roth for my brand new newborn. Yes, you, I guess you could technically do that. I think it's a little iffy. I waited until my daughter actually worked her first job because I wanted to get that skin in the game moment where she was actually priming the prompt pump on that custodial Roth where she worked her, you know, babysitting or working at Chick-fil-A. And then I did a dollar for dollar matching so I could also get the behavior going. So here's what I, let me, I've, I've gone on way, way too long. Matthew, what I did when I had a lump sum for my, for, to celebrate the birth of my child, I knew that my why at that point was I want this kid to go to college. I want to make sure, and it doesn't even have to be college. It can be technical school. It can be anything that just, you want to encourage education. I did a 529. That was the account I pre-funded um, for my brand new newborn because I wanted the option of having to pay for education. Now, here's the cool thing. 529s can actually be converted to Roth IRAs mm -hmm. at some point in the future. So, I mean, there is a, a an escape hatch on turning this money into tax-free growth. Um, so um, that's my choice. I would have put it in a, in a 529. You want to fight, or you you agree, disagree? No, no, I'd have put it. In, I'd put it in up, ma. I, that's what I would have done. I would have. I'd put it. In, I would take the fifty. You... I'd go open up an up. It's a custodial account that depends on the state you live in. Either Ugma or Upma. I would go yes. open that account. I'd park it. I'd buy some good low cost index fund or some really, really, really long dated target retirement fund. But gosh, I don't even know if they have them sixty five years out in the future. So I'd probably go with like a low cost. Well diversified index fund, and I'd let that junk just start rolling. What what happens when they get to college age? Oh, hopefully I'm going to save for college. Oh, for whoa, them too. whoa, whoa! That's not the variable that was laid out here. We didn't say both. The question this was, was the not question how do was, I pay for college? If I'm going to do it and I want it to get to a million by sixty five, where do I put it? You I were like, the question. But what if you, if you overfund? <laughs> uh, but but my point is, if you overfund a five twenty nine now, you have an escape hatch. For $35,000. Well, then all you you know, we're not going to get into this. But then we'll get into it. All you're doing then is you're robbing your child's future ability to be able to do Roth IRA contributions because That's true. that 6000 mm, eats see? up their bucket. So now, instead of you teaching them to fish, every year you just give them a $6,000 fish, $6,000 fish, $6,000 fish. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'll let this account over here grow for when you get to retirement. I want you funding your Roth. I want you. And if I can't, if, if I don't have the money to pay for college, I want you know you to go out and get student loans or grants or scholarships or whatever else. For the million dollar purpose, I'm putting it in the UPMA. All right. I mean, I don't <laughs> see this is once again hypotheticals. <laughs> that was you got lots of different angles there. Twelve on people go watch. We went we went on eight minutes there. Twelve people are gonna watch that. You might be surprised. They're gonna watch the end and be like, all I wanted to know was the UPMA. Yeah, I know. <laughs> All right, that was it. Was good though. It was interesting. We gotta fight. Uh, Brian would fight dirty, so Bo better be ready. It's messed Ooh. up, but also probably true. Ooh. Pick up him with a chair. No, I'm gonna call in relatives. Oh, I won't have, be the one fighting. I ain't gonna mess with them, Prestons. I know better. I know better than mess with them, Prestons. I'm not a fighter. I'm the organizer. <laughs> He's the organizer. He's the evil genius in the background. No, you know I, it, this is a sidebar. This is y'all didn't ask for it, but I'll give it to you. Here we go. Because because um, Buckle up. I got I've only been in like a few fist fights in my life, right? <laughs> and um, one of them, and I'm still good friends with a lot of these guys. In the first grade, um, was it first second grade? First, it was just to go first grade. I was in Cub Scouts. Uh huh. And um, all they, for some reason in Cub Scouts back then, everybody was get uh, they were assigning field positions like you're a general, you're a sergeant, you're a Colonel, I don't think Colonel, but they, it was, you, you get the point. Yeah, they made me a private. That's not good. I was ticked off that they made me a private. I was like, well, just because I moved into town last year, and you guys have known each other since you were in preschool together, I'm the private, and I didn't, I didn't like it. So at Cub Scouts, they did all this, but so at school the next day at the elementary school, I went and recruited my own army, and I gave us all different positions. And I, by the way, my recruiting was dirty, and the fact that I recruited the kids that had maybe been held back to make sure their education endeavors worked out better for he them. He picked all the bigger kids. <laughs> so 
We did it, and then we ended up getting in a little scuffle out on the playground. Oh. But I did, it was a fault in my plan and the fact that when I went back to Cub Scouts the next week, I'm general at the elementary school, uh, but, you but still... at Cub Scouts, I'm the private in their <laughs> army. So they all start throwing pine cones at me because I'm the I'm the army of one, and they're the, still their uh-huh. army because all my reinforcements were back at the elementary school or at home. And so they start pegging me with pine cones. I got ticked off. So uh, me and my buddy Justin got into it and started popping each other, you know, uh-huh. like landing blows. And by the way, he still got one more on me than I got on him. And I, <laughs> I kept track. Well, his dad was a, scub, a scout master, and he pulled us aside, and we were all worked up and um, gave us the Huck Finn, Tom Sawyer speech that they – I don't even know if that's a real thing, by the way, but <laughs> Harry Mack made it up. And then um, I still – because I still do spring training with Justin. I, I, all my Army members – I don't hang out with them, but I still hang out with all these guys from Cub Scouts. And they, and I still tell Justin that he's going to be like 73 years old and I'm going to hit him in the jaw. I I, I said, I I still get to hit you one more time. I love it. Wow. That was a little piece of history with Brian Preston. (laughs) Yeah. Pine cones. First grade. Pine cones. Pretty intense. If you ever do your studio tour, do not throw a pine cone at Brian. It will not end up well for you. Mm -mm. Yeah. All right. Ready for a few more questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot we're answering questions today. Yeah, let's do that. Some financial questions. Next up is a question from uh, the captain. (laughs) My elderly parents have a small whole life policy they've held for 35 years. How can I help them evaluate whether it makes sense for them to maintain the policy, cash it out, or something else? Yeah, this is this is a really difficult question because uh, insurance products are not all the same. They're not all created equal. And even insurance policies that are put in force today are not the same as ones that were put in force 30 years ago. So unfortunately, we won't be able to directly answer your question for like, okay, how do you do this? But the analysis that you need to go through are some pro and con analysis because there's a really good chance if your parents have been paying into this whole life policy for 30 years, there's a chance that it's maybe what's called paid up, meaning no additional premiums are required, no additional money has to go into it, it might be self-sustaining, that they could just stop putting money into it and the cash value therein that exists will be enough to pay for the death benefit for the remainder of their life. So basically it's a self-funded, paid for life insurance policy. The other alternative is you could look at surrendering it and you gotta see what the cash value is and what sort of costs would be associated with that. And you basically have to do a T-chart, right? Uh, Pros of keeping the policy, cons of keeping the policy. And then, unfortunately, I think you got to call the insurance company and ask them what options are available. Because sometimes you have to do this. You have to say, okay, hey, this policy is not yet paid up for the death benefit that exists. How much paid up insurance would there be if I wanted to convert this to a paid up policy? And like, if I had a $100,000 death benefit, maybe there's a... $70,000 $70,000 paid up option, we'd have to put any more money into it. So you really have to do sort of this cost benefit analysis around what options are available to you. And then once you see those three or four options, what, uh, which one of those options is the most advantageous for your parents? Um, first step, you got to figure out the why. And let me tell you the why for w- what you're doing with this when you look at this policy is because if you don't know the purpose for this and it, do you need it or do you not need it anymore? is you might be susceptible to sales or all kind of other things. Because remember, life insurance, a lot of times, the fees are front-end loaded. So I always say before you do anything with a whole life, figure out what the why is on it or any existing policies. And then you can also, how old is this policy? Because if you've already made it through the the gauntlet of paying all the high fees, now it's saying, well, are there some actually good redeeming things that are going on with this older policy? Um, so that's what I, I would want to know. What are the annual costs of this policy? What are the annual premiums that they're trying to charge you? And then I do. I, you're going to have to go. Here's your homework list. You got to go figure out the paid up coverage, meaning that you call the insurance company and you say, hey, how much if I just quit paying premiums today, will the cash value allow this to make it until my whatever my age I live to death? What's the benefit that it would pay me? And then you need to know the, the 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 surrender cash value. If you pulled that money out tomorrow, what's that surrender cash value? And then you need to ask a question of what's the basis, mm-hmm. because um, you're what you actually get to keep is that you know that's that surrender cash value. 
that's probably might be potentially taxable if your premiums, if the value exceeds what you paid in mm -hmm. premiums. That's what basis is, is how much you paid in on, on, on premiums. But compare those things. Mm -hmm. Know the why, though, because I ran into this. I just did this two weeks ago for a client. And um, I gave them all this list of variables. I need to go call the insurance agent. I need to know all this because we might just let this thing just ride out, figure out the paid up, and just let it go because um, you know, there's still some need for some insurance. But here's what actually happened. Called the insurance company, um, and, and they immediately, well, let, let, let us just roll that. We'll do a light kind of exchange of that cash value into a brand new policy. Mm -hmm. And we can, instead of this, because these were policies that were written back in the late 70s, and so the policies were only like twenty five, thirty thousand dollars. I mean, mm -hmm. the face value on them was not Relative that. Small. De death benefit was very small. They're like, well, how about we get you a hundred thousand dollar policy now? And I was like, no, this is this is. They have changed the equation uh -huh. and are asking questions. We are trying to give you answers for things we didn't even have on the on the docket for what we're trying to do. So that's why you you better do the homework of knowing your why before you call them because they're going they don't want to let go of the money they're going to want to and also realize there's a big incentive to rolling this cash value into a brand new insurance because then you get to collect fees and you get to start the clock all over again remember your benefit is you've already paid all those fees you're now on the other side of the fees so let's figure out if there's some redeemable value here through paid up uh, you know and and, and the benefits so and that doesn't mean that because if you are if you're young and you know there might be options to, to to buy more insurance, but we still like term for the majority of people. So whole life is 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 valuable for 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 a very specific purpose. So you better do the homework on the why before you do anything but else. But once you're in it, you have to do the analysis to make sure because I don't just assume that because you have a whole life policy, immediately you should surrender and get yeah. out of it. Because again, if you've been in it for a long time. It could have valuable benefits, like a really solid dividend that's paying, perhaps, especially if elderly parents, better than their rate of return on other assets. So you want to, again, it's a, it's a whole analysis you got to do. It's not going to be a blanket. And, yes and no. I don't want to know what other riders are attached to it, because like, do they put a, a long-term care provision on there? There might be some, especially if you have health issues now, but you didn't have health issues back when you got the policy. Pay it to, all that stuff matters, and I, and I hate I, I, this is I hate answering questions with questions, but these are the multiple facets that go into to making good financial sound decisions, and that's why I don't think planners, you know, w w our job's not going away. Love it. Awesome. All right, moving on to Sam's question. He says, "Hi, Money Guy team. Do you have any career advice for switching careers from a CPA to a financial advisor?" What are some things you wish you knew when you started as an advisor and you started on that career path? Well, it seems silly for me to weigh in on this one, right? <laughs> oh, if only, I know someone who might if know. If only we yeah. had like a resident expert on what it looks like to switch from being a CPA to being a financial advisor. Wouldn't that be, That'd be a great. super interesting Did Sam tell us how long he's been a CPA? He did not. But okay. Sam, if you're out I, there, I let us gonna, know. I was going to fine tune my answer. Because Here, here's the thing. I try to convince Everybody I can who's young, if you're trying, if you don't know what you want to do um, when you go to college, go be an accountant. And I, I really do mean it. I still stand by this. I, I, I convinced my niece to do this. I'm so proud of her. She's at UGA as an accounting major too, um, because I think accounting is the language of business. And if you, you know, there's so many things. Like I've got a, a guy that, that that's in one of my business groups. He's working through a business cell, and me and him were talking the other day. And I was like, man, I'm going to talk to you like I don't talk to anybody else because I know you come from a public accounting background. So we can we can talk our secret language because you understand all these numbers. You understand these formulas. And and I don't have to just bring it down. I, I was trying to make it very not not seem rude and, and condescending as CPAs maybe can be. But here's a, so Sam, congratulations. You're a CPA I already. I, I think that CPA is one of the greatest majors. But here's my word of caution. And I'm going to probably upset every one of my CPA friends out there. Sam has Don't. been a CPA for three years. Oh, I just man, you're right in the so window, Sam. Will help, Sam, yeah. I will tell you, because here's, here's the journey of a CPA. You come out and they crush you with work. I mean, you work a uh, lot of hours. 80, 90 you're hours getting a, a ton of experience. I lived through it. I think I, I was better for it because I really learned how to, 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 to understand how business works, a lot of tax seasons and so forth. But here's my thing is that you will get to a point. I, I, would, I would challenge Sam. Sam, look up the food chain from you 
and look at that your boss's life, the manager at the CPA firm you're at, and, and say, is this the life that I want? Because being a CPA is very lucrative once you get to like partnership level, but still there's this ultimate element that I've noticed with all my CPA friends that it leads to some burnout, is that you don't get paid unless you're 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 essentially doing work. Mm-hmm. This is the problem with attorneys too, is that yes, your time is very valuable, you get paid a premium, but that is tough work mm-hmm. to do when you're forty eight years old. 52 years old, you still, yes, you bill at four or $500 an hour, but man, you still, you just don't get to come off. Mm-hmm. You have to be on at all times. Um, so that's why I think you see so many CPAs jump into consulting, um, becoming financial advisors and other things because your skill set is so valuable that it works out. But I do encourage CPAs, go into public accounting, get that, get that grind but then get out mm-hmm. um, and, and go figure out. And it sounds like, Sam, you want to get into to the financial space, but here's, let me go ahead and throw the cold water on you. You make a great living as a CPA. Um, when you come back into the financial space, the only people that pay you great money, you make, a, let me say this a better way. The sky's the limit as a financial advisor on what you can make. Mm-hmm. But the entry level, if you're going to do it right, is going to be less than what Probably CPAs are paid. It's going to be a step CPA. back for a three-year CPA to get into the profession. But but if you do it right, you'll, you'll catch back up four to five years in the future. Um, so you just have to ask yourself, is it worth taking that step back? Because all, and I want to caution you, if you go to some of these other financial outfits that they tell you immediately how much money you're going to make, Ask them at what point you have to start calling friends and family and asking to manage your money because that's actually the worst thing that can happen. I th- I need you to to, to respect the ten thousand hours that require that's required to become an expert on anything. So if you came into financial planning, um, you would not I would not want to call a family or friend until I was four or five years into that profession mm-hmm. so that I actually do good work for them because they love you. They're going to they're take the call because they love you and they care about you. So you owe them the same respect to not call them until you love them enough that you're going to call them as an expert, not just somebody who needs a favor so that you can actually get your first account because you're not going to know you're not going to know up from down. Right out of the gate. So be careful of the get rich quick places that are going to churn and burn through your through your client list mm-hmm. and your friend list and your family list. Um, get the experience, but know it's probably going to be a step back to go forward. One thing that I'll tell you is if you are interested in going the financial advising route, this is a field that you want to you want to look at. I would encourage you to go look at the certified financial planner designation, the CFP designation. We think is probably one of like the prerequisites to like do this. I mean, it's not a necessity, but we really like seeing that as something we place a lot of value on for our younger associates coming through. So it's really easy to go look at like what course curriculum is required as a CPA. You might be able to exempt out of a lot of it, but you can go and get the materials and see, okay, what kind of information is covered? What kind of things would I be learning and doing as a financial advisor? And just looking at that, that corpus of curriculum, would allow you to figure out, okay, is this something I really like? Or, or do I just like the investing side? Do I not really care about the estate planning and the insurance analysis and the tax stuff and the retirement stuff? Or no, do I actually love all of that? And if you love all of that and you can kind of get through some of that material and it keeps you juiced up, by all means go in that direction. But I'd at least like stick my big toe in before I left the accounting world because you may find I just really like doing accounting work and that's okay. It's just there's different trade-offs associated with that. Um. I want you to go to our careers and check out our jobs too. Yeah, we but, go. But I do want to um, caution because I had a friend, super successful CPA, and, and he's like, "Man, I, I just want to come work with you." And I was like, "Look, we have a lot of retirees that come and work with us. You, you could do it." And I, I said, "This would be the starting salary." And he goes, "Is that a month?" <laughs> and I was like, "No." So I, that's the only thing I tell Sam: you got to figure out where your journey is because some people let get too far in. I mean, because. That, that is, this is no different than being an entrepreneur is if you have to take a step back to go a step forward, timing matters yep, a lot. So sure. if you've, if you've got a lot of family and friends, I mean, if you got a spouse and children and you, you know, it, th- those life choices have, they squeeze down your decision, your path to success is a lot more limited. So look at that. But I will tell you, Sam, it is the greatest profession. I always, I love being a financial planner because our clients love us. I wake up feeling like I'm adding value every day when we're working with clients. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's, just, it's a good, it, and I don't think burnout. I, I went from when I started working as a public accountant, I already had a plan that I was going to retire 
between 50 and 55. And now here I am quickly approaching both of those dates, and I couldn't imagine leaving the workforce. That means you're working in the right field, that you actually still get excited this many years, multiple decades into the career, and still love doing it every day. Agreed. That's good stuff. Thanks for the question, Sam. Hopefully that helps you out. Next up is a question from Charlie. If I am picking stocks in my individual brokerage and Roth IRA accounts, at what point should I take profits? I have some positions up 80% in a very short period of time. What advice do you have for Charlie? Man, I'll, I'll start off. All um, right. I think sometimes, because Charlie, I'd be curious to know where you are in the financial order of operations. I hope that you've... um. You know, because the, the, this is the reason we talk about index funds and not outsmarting yourself. Because the most important part when you get around step five of the financial order of operations is how much are you saving, not what you're saving into. Mm-hmm. And, and and here's why. Before before you question, because look, a lot of you are going to say, "Man, I I'm making good money." Because he says in the short term he's up eighty percent on some of this stuff. This is the dilemma of stock investing is because every one of the, 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 the no-brainers I've ever landed, I typically sold out of them by the time they were up two to 300%, whereas if I'd have stayed the course in them, I'd have made 1,000%. And then after I sold them, after they made like um, two or 300%, I'm mad at myself and I'm still mad at myself for it. And I'm just telling you, you're wasting a lot of calories, a lot of your mental horsepower on something that might be great because you're 80 i'd be curious to know what the what is as a, a dollar amount 80 percent i mean is that a thousand bucks two thousand bucks because mm-hmm. i i would think over the long term it, i would try to figure out how can you max out your roth ira and and an index fund that you focus on now that i've gotten the roth how do i get to my retirement because now you're not trying to figure out do i buy do i sell um, because it, it just cut because even if you you hold this holding and it makes a thousand percent for you, you still go every day. It's now your focus is going to be on man. When do I get out of this thing? Because now I've got more of my financial life tied into this one, you know, egg. All my eggs are in this one basket. I've really got myself connected to this thing. It's just so much drama when I don't think it needs to be that way. I'd rather you be a stock picker after you've set up all the other steps of the financial order of operations, and this is kind of like one of those step eight type things where it's just fun to play around with from an emotional standpoint, get your foundation first. Does that sound too much like old man on the front porch? With oh, that yeah, phone? yeah, for sure. But okay. but you're right. This is the time when you're the right old man on the front porch. Okay, uh, okay. Because here's what I, here's what kind of made my, my um, the hair on my arm stand up a little bit. Uh, if you're going to be a stock picker, and that's the method you choose to go, it's really hard because you've already figured out you got to get two things really, really right. I got to buy at the right time and I got to sell at the right time. And every time I sell at the right time, I got to go then decide what else I'm going to buy. And I got to buy that thing at the right time and sell at the right time. So it's a really hard proposition. So what I tell people is if you're going to do day trading or maybe you're not even day trading, but if you're just going to do individual stock trading, hearing that you're doing that inside your Roth IRA makes me really, really nervous because those Roth dollars are so, so, so valuable that if you screw up, if you're like, oh man, this is gonna be the one that goes to the moon and you allocate dollars there and then it doesn't happen and it goes down and it hits an unrecoverable or something like that, I just worried that those dollars are so valuable, I would not play with those because if you lose money in your Roth, it's a double whammy. I don't get to take the deduction in my Roth and because of the limits on how much can go into Roth every year, I might not be able to get that money back into the Roth, or at least not into it unless I do it over a number of years. So if you're going to be trading individual stocks, I'd say, okay, do that, but maybe keep it isolated to your brokerage account. At least then you can take advantage of losses and you can do that sort of thing. As for the when to take profits question, because you say now you have a position up at 80%, I love how you framed it at the dollar value matters. Uh, 80% gain if you're up a thousand bucks. Okay, yeah, maybe I want to see how far this thing goes. Maybe I want to keep riding it. 80% gain, you're up a couple hundred thousand dollars. Well, now you're talking about like life changing money that may have a very real impact on what financial independence and income streams and that sort of thing in the future looks like. Uh, we have a saying here that uh, trees don't grow to heaven, good things may not persist to be good things forever. Uh, one in the hand is worth two in the bush. I mean, I can throw out all these different cliche sayings, but there's some truth in that. So if you've made a lot of really good money and you have some stocks that are up 80%, 
Now, I'm not saying that you ought to sell them all immediately, but I would be thinking through if this is more than five or if this individual holding is more than five to 10% of my total portfolio value, even if I don't know exactly when I'm going to exit, I should have an exit strategy. Perhaps that's reverse dollar cost averaging. Perhaps that's putting in some sort of limit orders. Perhaps that's fill in the blank for the thing, but I would at least have in my mind, okay, how am I going to begin to divest out of this position? So I'm not one of those people that watch this thing run up, make me 80%. And then I watch it run back down, wait for the recovery. And I'm just sitting there and I lost all that potential value that could have been there. I, I would, um, good news, because I didn't realize it was in the Roth account. So the good he news- He said he was trading in his brokerage and his Roth. Okay, on the Roth assets, you can trade it tomorrow, I mean today, and then immediately buy into like a total market index right. or an index target retirement fund and go ahead and make that motion. Then here's the thing, I don't want you to think I'm telling you to never do individual stocks, but here's what I would do. I always like creating goals to reward good habits. So if you're not at $100,000 of, of liquid investments, or if you've not made it to step eight of the financial order of operations, you know, go ahead and challenge yourself that, you know what, I'm going to do with these guys. I'm going to go ahead. Today is the day. I'm going to do this the, 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 the consistent way. Go into that total market index or that index target retirement fund. Get out of all the reindeer games, but the, uh, you'll reward yourself when you get to step eight of the financial order of operations or a few hundred thousand dollars that you can go allocate you know, 10, 15, $20,000 to go play and goof off with. I'd be perfectly fine with mm -hmm. that, but I think there's no time better than today um, because it's not like I'm shortchanging. You know, that's why I always remind people because if you want innovation, if you want to see things, go look at it. Go look at the S&P 500 or the total market index. You'll see Tesla's there. Mm -hmm. You're going to see Google's there. You're going to see, you know, Apple's there. Anything and everything that you're thinking about will be sitting in that index likely. Rather than picking the winners in a market-weighted index like that, the winners bubble up to the top, right? Yeah. You know, it's kind of the way that it works. Well, you're sport fishing right now. And I always, you know, and I've used this analogy many times, sport fishing can be fun because um, you get to go tell your friends, man, I caught a, I caught a 16-pounder today. And you get to do the, the whole fish hands and everything else. But the, the reality is, is that I want you fishing with nets because your life and what the, the purpose and the why of what you need it to do for you is so much more important that you're not looking for the big fishing stories you can go tell and impress your friends with. You're looking to actually ensure to buy the that boat. no matter what, you're going to have something that provides for your retirement in the future. So you go fish with nets, and that's an index fund. You know, Save the sport fishing to when you've actually built enough assets up that you, you have the time and, and extra margin in your life that, that you can go do those fishing stories. All right. Thanks for the question, Charlie. We're going to move on to Jordan's question. Should my choice in saving into Roth, HSA, 401k for a house down payment or for my rainy day fund depend on my why and my period in life? Saving for all of it at the same time can feel difficult to navigate. So I know some of these you may have a handy dandy handout that helps with and some of it I think is good for you to speak to the mentality surrounding it. Where, where would someone find that handy dandy handout? Oh, I mean, it, it, it's always, I was like, is Jordan must be brand new because I mean, this thing <laughs> is practically dancing in front of him, just going, Jordan, Jordan, every dollar that comes into your, your grasp, I have a plan for you. I mean, all you have to do is seriously look at the financial order of operations. And if you have built up a large enough and you're really trying to accelerate this, go to learn.moneyguy.com for the actual course. We'll, we'll find a place, a purposeful place for every dollar that you've built up. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me again, he said, I'm trying to decide between Roth. So Roth, HSA and 401k and then the rainy day fund are kind of all covered in the food. Like you're going to say which ones to do first, which ones to prioritize. He also mentioned house down payment, mm -hmm. which I know is a little bit trickier. Yep. So maybe you can speak so to that. So when it comes to the, the other ones, the financial accounts, the Roth, HSA, the merchant fund, uh, financial order of operations is the answer, right? Because in our view... You don't move to the next step until you pre finish the previous step. So you don't go get your employer match unless you've got your deductibles covered. You don't pay off the high interest debt if you're not getting the employer match. You don't, uh, and then you move on to the emergency fund, and then you move on to the tax-free stuff, and then you move on to the tax-deferred stuff. So if you will just work through the financial order of operations, it will, it will keep you true. It will keep you aligned so that you're moving in the right direction. Now, this idea around, okay, but what about a down payment? Yeah. Like, where does that come in? I get it. That's hard, right? That's a difficult thing because 
then you do have to come back to the why. Like funding my emergency fund versus funding my Roth is not a why question. That is a where are you in the cycle question. Saving 25% or building for a down payment or some mix of both, that's a why question. Yeah. And you have to answer the question, okay, what is the ultimate goal I have for these dollars? I, I want financial independence and I want retirement and I want to be able to move in that direction. But realistically, before I get there, I probably want to own a home and start a family and settle down and establish roots. And it's okay to prioritize this goal at one point, And then once that goal is satisfied, move to the other. But we are of the opinion that it doesn't have to be an all or nothing. It doesn't have to be completely, but I'm only going to do this one or that one. I think you can approach and target both of them. I, I think you said something that's very valuable there. Look, when you're getting to all the way through step four, which is emergency reserves, step five, which is, you know, the HSA and the Roth, um, starting that through an IRA, if you can, is that, that those are purposeful dollars. Mm -hmm. You have to know that. But when you get to like step six, those are where you can get into more of the why and, and the saving for the house down payment. The, the, I, I think you can transition from why and you add the, um, the, 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 the thing that brings in even more focus, the win. Mm -hmm. Like if you know you want to buy a house in the next 24 months, you know you're getting close to, you're into step six of just trying to get to 20, 25%. You could, there's nothing wrong with saying, I, okay, I know in 24 months I'd like to have a house down payment. Maybe I can make some concessions over here in step six to see if I can create an intersection, mm -hmm. in, intersection point where I'm still funding both, both. goals, yep. but they're going to line up perfectly from a timing standpoint where I get to do it all. This is the power of planning mm -hmm. is that you do take these different decision matrix things, these different incremental decisions you have to make and see if you can create intersection points between the why, the when, and then the how is obviously what we've tried to create with both the, the financial order of operations, the know your number course, because if you're trying to fine tune all these variables into your perfect maximized financial life, that's what we're, we're trying to give you all the variables to make it all happen. And and I think Jordan's question, I think the, he, he or she took at the end of it said it's hard, right? Like it's it, hard to do. He's, saying it's hard to do it all at the same time yeah basically look and here's here's the deal it is you, yeah it is like building financial independence is hard saving money is hard following the financial order of operations it's all simple it's all very simple but it's it's not easy it's hard and that's why the why is what keeps you motivated the reason that we're able to do hard things is because the why on the other end is more important than the pain that we feel today. Deferring gratification isn't fun. We'd all rather consume today and have the day, but the joy of knowing that I'm doing the hard thing today so that I can have the better thing tomorrow is incredibly valuable. But I think that we live in this world with TikTok and Instagram and social media where it makes it look like it's not supposed to be hard. Like there's all these 25 and 30 year olds bebopping around, driving fancy cars, living these fancy lifestyles. That's not reality. That's yeah. not what reality is. And so if you are in that stage and you're finding that it's hard to build wealth and it's hard to save and it's hard, you're in the right place because it's not an easy thing. I, I saw it just yesterday. Um, somebody posted, I think it was on Twitter, was if you make the hard decisions while you're young, mm -hmm. you'll have an easy life. Yep. If you make easy decisions while you're young, you're going to have a hard life. Yep. So I think if, if it feels like it's hard, Jordan, that means you're probably doing it right. Um, because you don't see, you know, we always say don't skip leg day. That's because you got to build that financial foundation mm -hmm. um, and do the hard work that nobody else is willing to do while you're young. Um, you're going to have the base. You're going to have the success because you didn't skip leg day. So so you'll be congratulated and you'll be able to live in that prosperity from that, that discipline and making all three ingredients of, of wealth creation work for you. You're going to be rewarded. Just hang in there. Awesome. Hey, we love answering your questions. If you have more questions, head to moneyguy.com slash resources. We have tons of free downloads for you that are all based on things we talk about all the time and are all based on things that we get questions about all the time. So definitely check that out if you haven't. And then again, we'll be back here live streaming 10 a.m. next week. So hope to see you there. Guys, I'm your host, Brian Preston. Mr. Bo Hansen, Reby and the rest of the Money Guy team. Money Guy. Out. Oh.